Good morning, Rabbi. Good morning. You got your package? Yes. Thank you so much, Rachel Frana. I brought the book home. Okay. Okay. Um, I put these on the table. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so we're on page three in the booklet, and we're up to Gimel. So, so far, what he explained was the difference between the ordinary level of Amuna, which is expected of everyone, all the nations of the world, and that is the way the world is to be seen as Pitl Hayesh. There is a world, the world has, to some degree, its own identity, but there's something greater and higher that is invested in the world, gives life to the world, <clears throat> and that's called Bitlayesh. And the way Yidna are commanded to believe is that the relationship with Hashem and the world is much deeper. And without Hashem, there is no, the world has no existence in its own right, totally not. And therefore, the world is bitl b'metzius, which means that it doesn't have its own identity at all. And everything in the world is attributed just to Hashem without that energy wouldn't exist even for a moment. And <clears throat> that's the high level of Amuna, to recognize that Hashem and the world are absolutely one. There is no substance to the world and everything in it without Hashem. Then he went on to explain how the power to have this Amuna is transmitted to us through the Matzah. And he explained, what does it mean transmitted through the Matzah? It means that Hashem took his knowledge, the way he sees the world, which is the Emes, the way Hashem perceives the creation, that it's one with Hashem, because to him there is no concealment. And Hashem, in a sense, invests that knowledge in the matzah. And then when we eat the matzah and we digest the matzah, that knowledge becomes part of us. We're able to have some uh, sense of understanding and having that amuna in Hashem the way it is in, in, in reality, that Hashem and the world are absolutely one. And he gave a few mishalom of this with a child, with a mishnah, or mishalom of how the greatest depth can be condensed in something very small. And that's the same here with the matzah. And in fact, what we believe is also very small. We can't compare that to the true amunah, the way Hashem knows it and sees it. But nevertheless, in it is all the depth. <clears throat> Now we're going to start with Gimel. Vihine. Kameish and its tabu alachilas matzah, but says in Mitzrayim. Just like the Eden were commanded to eat matzah when they went out of Mitzrayim, the Pearl Mamish went out of Mitzrayim in actuality, 3,000, over 3,300 years ago. Kach and its tabu alachilas matzah or the Deirus. We were also commanded to eat matzah for all future generations. Kedixir, as it's written, Berev techel matzahs, at night you should eat matzahs. Hakosov kovei choiva, the Torah made it into an obligation. Not every night, but the first night of Pesach, we're obligated to eat matzah, it's a mitzvah. So we just finished explaining that the reason why we needed the matzah was because we were in Mitzrayim. We were amongst the nations of the world. And the nations don't have this amuna. 
the way they understand Hashem is the most that they can reach is to understand that Hashem is the one who gives life to everything in the world, but that the world still has its own independent identity. And Hashem and the world are like the Neshama and the Guf. I want to add something uh, to explain in a little bit more in a practical way, where could be the difference between the two ways. If Hashem gives life to the world like the Neshama gives life to the Guf, or that it's much more than that, that the world is but to it says it doesn't have any substance, any identity of its own. Of its own. One of the places where this would manifest is in the concept of Hashgacha Pratis. In other words, we believe that everything that happens is from Hashem. So let's make the analogy with the Nisham and the Guf. Is it true that everything that the body can function, can do, is because of the Nisham, the way we understand it according to Torah? Yes, the ability to see is because of the Nisham, the ability to hear, the ability to think, the ability to feel, the ability to have emotion, walking, using my hands, talent, everything comes from the neshama, but it is, it is functioning through the tools which are the body. Is it possible for something to happen to a person that's purely biological, physical, it's not because of the neshama? What? Let's think for a second. Could you imagine anything happening when a person speaks? Yes, it's from the neshama. Person thinks it's from the neshama. Person sees is the neshama. Is there anything that could be happening with the body that's not related to the neshama? Just sleeping. what? Sleeping. sleeping. Well, I think the definition of sleeping is that the neshama is in a sort of subconscious state. What if a person cuts himself and, and his fingers bleeding? Is that connected to the neshama, or is that physically because of the body? The body, right? It's not a faculty. It's it's a physical thing. I have a body. There are veins and there's blood. So if you cut the finger, there's going to be blood. Yeah, but you you feel because of the neshama. Oh no, the feeling, the pain is the neshama. You're right, but the mere fact that there's blood flowing, that's something physical. If a person falls and something breaks, it's something physical. These are things that are not connected. What happened is, is a result of the physical body, in a way, has nothing to do with the neshama. And the reason is because the neshama and the body are two separate things, except one goes into the other and gives it life. So, of course, there are things that can happen to the body which are attributed to the body itself, nothing to do with the neshama. The same would apply to the world, that when a person sees this world as it has its own identity, and it has its own, it's an entity on its own, and Hashem is invested in the world <clears throat> and gives life to the world and makes things happen, but there can still be things happening that are not related to Hashem, they're just related to nature, just like things happen to the body because it's a body. So there could be a change in weather, it could be a storm, it could be a hurricane, it could be a volcano, there could be a, a uh, earthquake. These are things that are physical, you know, manifestations of change that take place in the physical world. And many other things that could happen is just the way Hashem, Hashem created a world. We have a world, a world has certain laws of nature. So things happen just because of nature, not necessarily Hashem. And then Hashgacha Pratis is not so complete. It's not really everything, every detail. How do I know that this that happens because Hashem made it happen? Maybe this is just a result of something natural that just the way it works out. <clears throat> so I have a job, very good job, and everything is fine. And my boss decides to sell the business to someone else. I get a new boss. The new boss is a very difficult person and he fires me. Is this Ashgacha Pratis? So this is just things happening in the physical. So we know it's Ashgacha Pratis. 
But somebody who believes in Hashem, but also believes that the world has sort of a, a has its own pattern, has its own nature. The world is a world and has its own identity. They can say maybe this just happened just because you know something is just a, it's a natural consequence that when a person. Uh, leaves a job and someone else, a business, someone else takes over the business. The person's not a nice person and that person is harassing me and fires me. So I lost my job. Has, in a way, nothing to do with Hashem. Who says that every little detail, every iota, everything in life has to do with Hashem? But if I understand that the world and Hashem are absolutely one, and the world doesn't have, world meaning the world, nature, science, it doesn't have its, any identity of its own, then yes, every single thing that happens is by Goha Pratis, because if not for Hashem wanting it, it couldn't happen. That would be a practical difference. Do you follow this? Any questions? In terms of, in terms of like, when we get a cut, that's like just the body. Right. It's not that, it's, right. So I'm using that. The world, everything is a shell, but, but how can it be right, but, but without, without but, wanting it? But just like the body just has a physical structure, and there are things that happen because of that physical structure, which is there are veins. Mm -hmm. The veins carry blood, they're blood vessels. If something happens to the vessel, then the blood. Uh, leaks out. That's it's not because the neshama made it happen. That's just a physical uh, consequences. So therefore, we can say the same thing with the world and the nature of the world. That there are certain things that happen that they're just natural consequences. When the, you know, let's say Hashem wanted to make a hurricane for whatever reason, but once there is a hurricane, a lot of other things happen. Those are just natural consequences of a hurricane. Remember we gave the story with the man who Hashem wanted to, to throw his hat into the water? It's a story in Gemara with somebody called Rabbi Yisrael Maker Shabbos. Right, he had a dream that this Jewish man who lives in his community is going to have all his wealth. Not a dream, he had a saw in the, in the stars. So he wanted to make sure it doesn't happen. So he sold everything he possessed. He was very wealthy and he bought a huge diamond and he had the diamond sewed into his hat and he never went anywhere without that hat, held on to it. And he knew for sure, there's no way this Jew is gonna get my wealth. And then one day he was crossing a bridge and a wind just started blowing out of nowhere and he was caught off guard and the hat flew off his head and went into the water and, and he lost the hat with the diamond. On the other end of the town, it was Friday and this Jew was, extremely uh, um, careful with Shabbos. He gave all the honor to Shabbos. He was called Rabbi Yosef Maker Shabbos, meaning Rabbi Yosef who honored the Shabbos. And he always made sure to get the best fish, the biggest fish for Shabbos. So that Friday he caught a fish. And when his wife opened the fish, she found this huge diamond inside. That means Hashem made this wind for a purpose. The purpose was that his hat should fall into the water, a fish should swallow the diamond, and this family should get that diamond. But once there's a big wind blowing, didn't other things happen as a result of the wind? Somebody's tree fell down. Someone else lost his hat. Papers were flying all over the place. So is that also Ashgacha Prati or that's? No, Ashgacha Prati is that should be a wind to blow his hat down. Once there's a wind blowing, then naturally there are consequences. But isn't that us? Like, it is. Want. We believe that, right? <laughs> but I'm saying, but if you don't believe that Hashem and the world are absolutely one, yeah. then we could believe that certain things are are sort of a right. consequence of nature and not necessarily Hashem. I'm, I'm a victim of nature, and that's where, unfortunately, even people sometimes who believe in Hashem have this. They don't recognize that everything is from Hashem. So in a sense, the more I recognize this oneness with Hashem, the more I recognize Hashgacha Pratis, and the more that makes it, allows a person to feel simcha because they realize that everything is from Hashem. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't understand why the Kinnah is really immune off of that level, because if you, isn't it enough to know? If I know that everything is at the end of the day what Hashem wants, are you saying that it's too high, so we still need 
this level of emuna to, to what well, you're asking that something else should be enough. What's the something else that you're talking about? So if you tell me that it's a proper part of this, something happened to me, and I know that, then why do I need the moon to believe? On what basis can someone say that it's all Hajgaha practice? What's the basis? Who says that everything, every detail that happens is Hajgaha practice? Because it's a concept. That's a concept that's. Based on what? Based on what? <laughs> well, based on what you say, Rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> I believe everything you say, Rabbi. Okay. I know anyway, I think you should take ten thousand dollars out of your bank <laughs> okay. account if you can find it. <laughs> write out a check. <laughs> You're saying the same thing. I'm saying in different words. <laughs> okay. Basically. You know that everything on Dragon Press, why? Because you know that Hashem and the world are one and the world has no separate independent yeah. power whatsoever. And that's the Amuna that we're talking about. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm with the program. <laughs> well, that was quick. Okay. So at the time, the Eden were in Mitzrayim, and that was, that was the belief of people in Mitzrayim. They couldn't relate to this kind of belief. So Hashem said, now I'm taking you out of Egypt, physically, geographically, and spiritually. You'll be able to have the higher level of Amuna, and how will we get this through the matzah? So in a certain sense, this process has to take place every single year. And that's why every single year, we're get, you're also supposed to be eating matzah. So now it goes on to explain that. This is called Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim on a personal level. Kiba'emes, in truth, I'm reading now the third line from Gimel. Tzorach liyez b'chines Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim b'ruchnias. We have to go through a process of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim in a spiritual sense, exodus of Egypt. And what that is, ki ata, gam ata, now as well. Kihine, the Yisrael yesh beis nefoshes. Every year has two souls, like it says in Tanya. Nevesh abahamis, hanim shechas meklipas nega. Nevesh abahamis that comes from klipas nega. In fact, sheshom shoyre shoayin umis. Klipas nega is the source for all seventy nations. The Koralea, the Koda, the Kaya, Pchinis Yesh. These are the 70 nations that we said before that the Gemara says they refer to Hashem as the God of all gods, which means they recognize that Hashem is the source of everything. He is the creator, He is the beginning, but He created powers in the world, and these powers operate and function somewhat independent of Hashem. There's a famous mimer where He gives the mushal of a king, that the king appoints ministers. This minister, you're in charge of the south of the country, and you're in charge of the north of the country, and you're in charge of the west of the country, and you're in charge of the east of the country. So each minister has his area that he's in charge of. And the reason why the king puts him in charge is that he should make independent decisions. The king doesn't want him to call them up every move he makes and ask him, should I do this, should I do that? If there's a major change, something which is a big question, of course, you should consult with the king. But other than that, on a day-to-day -day basis, the whole purpose why he put him there is that he should make his own independent decisions. That doesn't mean he denies that the king is the king. The king is the king. Not only that, the reason why the minister has any authority or power is because the king gave them gave them that power he delegated that authority to him but nevertheless in a way that he is making independent decisions so therefore they say hashem is on the card of the created forces whether it's angels and constellations the sun the moon the stars different forces in creation that they operate somewhat independently and yes hashem made it that way but once he made it they're operating independently that's what the that's what the nations of the world believe because they come from Klipas Noga. So our animal soul also comes from the same spiritual source. The nefesh of the kids, but the godly soul is chelik alaka mimau. It's part of Hashem. 
And it's different, it doesn't come from Klippas Noga, it comes from Hashem himself. When the neshama is still in heaven, before it descends, let's turn the page. The neshama is even higher than the angels. Now the angels are totally bottled to Hashem. Hagam shem mibchin is bittel. The angels are bottled to Hashem, which means that there's nothing in their life and there's nothing in their interest other than Hashem. They serve Hashem, they say Kaddish Kaddish Baruch, and they're ready to go on any kind of mission that Hashem will send them. They have no other interest in life, no other goal in life, and no other issue in life except for doing what Hashem wants. Utswa Shemayim Lechomish Tachemim the hosts of the heaven bow to you, is alluding to the angels. But even the angels, they don't have this full understanding of the essence of Hashem, because the angels were also created in a way that they have an identity. And they have an identity and which is separate from Hashem, the ilu hoya earth and sub mezgala lehen. If the earth and sub of the infinite light of Hashem would be revealed to them, are you betelim b'metzias? They would become totally nullified and gone. Kameshu kame. Ela shemeshavim ma'ilu yesh. So Hashem created an angel from nothing and becoming a, a yesh. Meaning a yesh meaning that he has his own identity. Because angels have thought, they have feelings, so they have their own identity. And Hashem did this idea, Tzimtzum Vehelim Ho'er, by concealing his light. Concealing his light that they shouldn't perceive and understand Hashem fully the way Hashem is, because if they would, they wouldn't be able to exist. And by hiding that, they can be created in a way that they're Pchinus Yesh. We call Mokim, nevertheless, even the angels, and Pchinus Bitla Yesh. Their level of Bitl is Bitla Yesh, Aidei Diyasam, Shemas Habim Me'ayim. They know that they're created by Hashem constantly, but Hashem created them to be and to have their own identity. So they have a Muna, they have knowledge of Hashem, but their knowledge of Hashem is also how they are, like, a, like the Nisham and the Guf, same idea. The Zenikra Katnus, this is a lower level of this Amuna. Our Nisham is Yisrael, but the Nisham. Let me just give a little back up a little bit, give a little introduction before we go there further. If someone would ask a question, who is higher, humans or malachim? The answer would be, what's the, what's the general answer for almost any question you ask in a Torah class? What? It depends. Very good. It depends. <laughs> That's the answer to everything. It depends. <laughs> depends what you're talking about. Down here in this world, Malachim are infinitely greater than humans. A story that illustrates this is the famous story of Reb Zusha, who was a very big tzaddik amongst the students of the Magid. Magid had 120 students, and each one was a very big tzaddik. And each one was a spiritual giant in his own right. And later, each one of them became a Rebbe of hundreds of thousands of Chassidim. But even among the 120 students, there were levels. Reb Zusha was one of the greatest of his students. So he once davened to Hashem, and he asked Hashem to give him a gift. And the gift is that he should be able to feel fear of Hashem the way an angel feels it. And before he knew it, he found himself praying again, desperately, that Hashem should take it away. Because it was so overwhelming that he just couldn't, he couldn't handle it. So here's a tzaddik, a tzaddik who serves Hashem with love and fear all his life, on a very high level. But yet, when he has to experience the level of an angel, he can't. And the reason is, in a simple way, because an angel doesn't have a physical body. So the angel can experience things in a much greater spiritual way. We have a body, the physical body can't handle such a, an intense spiritual experience. So the angels, their love for Hashem, their fear of Hashem, their knowledge of Hashem, their perception of Hashem is infinitely greater than us down here in the body. 
But the source is, is not that way. The source of the neshama comes from a higher place than the source of the angels. And in that way, neshama has an advantage over, even over angels. One of the places where we can see the advantage of a neshama over an angel is, <clears throat> we know in the Chumash, in the beginning of Chumash Bereshis, it talks about nephilim. Nephilim are angels that fell down from Shemayim. So perhaps you remember from learning the Parsha, that there were angels that complained to Hashem, like, why are you giving so much attention to humans, mortals down here on earth? They're nothing. Your attention should be completely up here with us angels. So Hashem said to the angels, that you'll see that they're greater than you. If I put you down in this world, you won't be doing so great either. So the angels came down to this world and they all became corrupt. That's what it says. They were the giants and they were the ones who became corrupt. So what does it mean? It means a neshama has the power to be in this physical world with all its challenges, with all its concealments and maintain a strong connection with Hashem. An angel is much, much higher than a human, but only when he's in Shemaim. When he comes down to this physical world, then he can't maintain that level and gets sucked in to the gashmius and to the concealment of this world and he loses it. So that is because the source of the neshama is from a higher place. This is similar to the difference between Yosef and his brothers. The brothers, they served Hashem, they were great tzaddikim, but they were shepherds, which means the way they served Hashem was by separating themselves, isolating themselves from whatever is going on out there in the world. Even when they went to Mitzrayim, they went to a land called Goshen, and they isolated themselves from everybody else so they wouldn't be influenced, and therefore they'll be able to um, concentrate on their relationship with Hashem. Yosef was such a tzaddik that he was able to be living in Mitzrayim, in the city, not a shepherd. In the city itself, he was li living in the heart of the city, which was the palace. And in the palace itself, he was second in command to Paro, which means he was very involved in everything going on. And imagine, in that condition, he was perfectly connected to Hashem, just like he was before he ever went to Mitzrayim. That's a very high level. That was the level of Yosef, which way he was unique compared to his brothers. The same is the difference between a neshama and malachim. Here's where we see how malachim are inferior to a neshama. The malachim can serve Hashem only when they're separated from the physical world. If they would be in the physical world, they couldn't keep that balance. A neshama could keep the balance because it comes from a higher source. So that's what he's saying. Down here in this world, once the neshama goes into a body, certainly the neshama is lower than the malach. We, what we experience, the way we experience godliness is um, inferior to the way malachim experience godliness. But in terms of our source, where we're coming from, the malachim come from a place where which is lower, and they don't have the ability to feel that oneness with Hashem of Bittl B'Metzias, but the Neshama comes from the essence of Hashem. And therefore, the Neshama could perceive and could experience things which are even greater than Malachim. Let's see the words inside again. One, two, three, four, five lines from the top. The last two words on the line. Ab on the Shamas Yisrael, but the Neshamas of Yidin. Meshachim Chachmasa is Barak. The Shama of Yid comes from the level of Chachma. Shahu Elokus Mamish. Chachma is a level where godliness is revealed in the, in the most complete way. Ve'enon Nifrodim Klau. And therefore, the neshama comes from a place that is not separated from Hashem at all. So the neshama, when it's up there before it descends, the way it perceives godliness is 
more than the way a malach perceives God, even an angel, because it uh, perceives godliness in the ten spheres, which creates a yeshmiyayin. is godless mamish canal. So basically, uh, the amuna of the neshama is greater, and the amuna of malachim is even weaker. Once the Nevesh al kids comes down to this world and gets invested in the Nevesh Bahamas and in the Guf, then it's lower, it's lower even than the angels. Because by being in the body and being in the Nevesh Bahamas, the Guf becomes so much separate from Hashem, so much of its own identity, that it has interests and pursues that are totally not godly. And the reason why Hashem did that is that the Nefesh al should transform the Nefesh al-Bahamis. So we are brought down to this world that we should transform our Nefesh al-Bahamis, that it should have bitl to Hashem. And the, the level of Bittl Tashem on an ordinary is just Bittl Ayesh. So Nefesh Bahamis is a separate entity. It feels separate. It has animalistic desires and pursuits and passions. But yet, it submits itself to Hashem's authority. So that's Bittl. But that's not the ultimate Bittl. So this is the reason why we have to go out of Mitzrayim every single day. What's the purpose of going out of, what does it mean going out of Mitzrayim on a personal level? This is the hidden meaning, the mystical secret behind going out of Mitzrayim every day. What it means is when you look at the Mishnah, we also say this in the Haggadah, that a person should every day see themselves if they're going out of Mitzrayim, it's talking about history. Every day, remember that we went out of Egypt and think every day that if we hadn't gone out of Egypt over 3,300 years ago, we'd still be in Mitzrayim today. But here he's saying that we're actually going out of Mitzrayim today, not as if or we would have been. But every day, in terms of our serving Hashem, we're experiencing a process which is identical to going out of Mitzrayim the first time. And that is every day on a, on a certain level when it comes to davening and we say the Shema, we're meant to experience that deeper amun in Hashem, the deeper perception that Hashem and the world are absolutely one. When is this? Mainly in the Shema, when we say the words Havaya Lokeinu Havaya Echod, Hashem our God, Hashem is one. Shazel Mashinis Yachet L'Neshom Yisrael Kanal. This is the amuna that's been designated for the Yidin, that they are required and they are capable of having this Amunah. And not only the Godless soul, but Gam Nevesh Bahamis, this Hapech should also be transformed, the day to have this perception. Because when a person davens, he's davening in a way that he explains Godliness to himself and thinks about Hashem in a language and a way that even the animal soul in him could understand it. So ultimately, he gets to a place where his godly soul is experiencing and thinking about the absolute bitl of the world, Hashem, and even his animal soul can get to that place as well. Remember in Basilagani, we were learning about this as well, that the ultimate purpose is that the Nevesh kiss transforms the animal soul. So therefore, when we meditate on godliness, we shouldn't think about subjects that are totally abstract, totally removed from our reality, because then the Nevesh Bahamas can't relate to it. We, we gave the example, it's like when you want to talk to another Jew about Yiddishkeit, and that person, Yiddishkeit is new to them, you can't talk about Yiddishkeit in a way that they can't relate to it. So if you want to explain them mitzvahs like matzah or mitzvahs like Shabbos or kashras, you have to find the words and the language and the ideas that they could relate to in the place where they're coming from right now. And that's how I have to, in a sense, talk to my own Nevesh Bahamas. 
And the goal is because only then will the Nebuchadnezzar become inspired and become transformed. So Shema Yisrael is a time where the Nebuchadnezzar kiss meditates on this oneness with Hashem. And I have to meditate in such a way that even the Nebuchadnezzar in me gets excited and feels this unity of Hashem and the world is one. So this is Yitzhi's Mitzrayim. Then going out of Mitzrayim was going out of Egypt. There were people, there was a nation that had, didn't have the proper level of belief. And we went out of that nation and we got the right level of belief. Every day, it's me, myself, and I. In me, there's a part of me that doesn't have the right kind of belief. That's my Nevesha Bahamas. And every day, I'm supposed to take my Nevesha Bahamas out of its personal Mitzrayim and bring it to recognize and believe that Hashem and the world are one, and the Bittl is a total Bittl, complete Bittl, Bittl B'Metzias, not just Bittl Ayesh. Let's do one more piece here. It says in a person when they daven, they should um, their heart should be directed towards Shamayim and their eyes should be directed towards earth. What does that mean? In simple level, it means to be looking down, but your heart is looking up. But here he's explaining it a little bit deeper than that. I have to explain it before we read the words inside. What he's saying is that when a person is davening and realize that Hashem of the world is one, if they would just think of it that way, Hashem of the world is one, and, the, and as if to say the world in its own right is nothing that doesn't exist, then you're thinking about this oneness and this bittle in such a way that it's so far removed that after the davening is over and after you sort of open your eyes after Krishna and you look around at the world, you won't see the connection with what you just were thinking about in davening. Because as you're davening, it's as if the world doesn't exist. In fact, you cover your eyes, you close your eyes, there is no world. If there's no world, then when you go open your eyes and go back into the world, you don't make the connection between that and Hashem. So it's very important that even when you're thinking about Hashem and how He is everything, at that same moment, I have to also connect it to the world that I live in. I know what I just now said is a little bit abstract. I have to explain it a little bit better. Practically, what does that mean? I'll give you an example. Is it possible? Let's say a person is struggling, struggling at business, goes to work, and they're struggling in the business with a challenge. What's the challenge? Let's say honesty. He has so much opportunity to make more money by doing things that are not so straight and not so honest, and he knows that it's wrong, but uh, he's struggling with it. It's a test because by doing it the way he does it, he can make a lot of money. So he's davening. And in davening, that's a good time to make all the different kind of achlotas. So what if a person is davening and he thinks to himself, Hashem is everything and nothing exists, not the heaven, not the earth, and not the, and not the stars and the constellations. It's all one, it's all Hashem, right? Is it possible after thinking about that real deeply, go back to the business and do exactly the same thing you did yesterday? Because there's really no connect between Hashem is everything and I should be honest in business. The only way there can be a connect is that when I'm thinking about Hashem is everything, I have to also connect it. And that means that he's in charge of my sustenance and he's the one who brings me the Parnassah. And therefore, only if I'll do things the way he wants and the way he is pleased with, 
then I'll get the bracha of Panas. And by doing things in an inappropriate way, in a dishonest way, I won't be able to, if I realize everything's from Hashem, that'll lead me to doing things in an honest way, the way Hashem wants. But I have to make the connect. If I don't make the connect, I can say to myself, Hashem is amazing, He's infinite. In fact, I can uh, uh, I could focus on this thought for hours, how infinite he is, but I won't have any connect. So therefore, in my business, I should do this, that, or the other thing. Unless I make in my mind that connection that Hashem is infinite and he's everything, even in my business. But I don't think about those words, it won't, it won't, it won't have the effect, the desired effect it's supposed to have on me. Follow? Yeah. It's like, like somebody would say, the heavens are bottled Hashem, and the earth is bottled Hashem. The stars, the constellations, the angels, the angels in Atsilas and Bri, Atsilas, and me also. I should also be bottled Hashem. Can you think about everything? I have to connect it to me. And if I don't connect it to me, then it's amazing thoughts, but it's removed from me. So he's going to explain that even when we're saying the Shema, we're thinking about Hashem and His greatness on the most uh, spiritual, abstract, removed level, it's not enough. We have to also connect it to the world that we're living in. And that's what it means that the heart looks up, but the eyes have to look down. To be continued. In this class is where the heart looks up, and the next class is halacha, is where the eyes look down. Thank you, Rabbi. Good Shabbos. You're welcome. Good Shabbos. Hi, Nama. Hi. Is that Chava? Yeah. Oh, yay. Hello. <laughs>